is and then you find out. <laughs> the buck stops here. I'm trying to blame Ella for as many things as we possibly can. Well, she still can't defend herself. <laughs> Thus far, she's been pretty bad. We do say so ourselves. Genetics. Genetics. Wait a minute. Pull that over me. Your mom did say you got the most bankings, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't explain why I can't remember my childhood. <laughs> so traumatic. Sherry was like, we're, we're going to spank our kids? <laughs> Yeah, weren't you? Never. If she just gave me the look, I was ready to cry. <laughs> I needed more than a look. <laughs> more than a look. Yeah, maybe that would explain. Uh, probably all this stuff is related. Let's get into it and see if it relates. Um, well, honestly, you know a lot of what it is. We have to define fellowship. Okay, we're getting into this journey right now with our first John study, where where we are where we are still kind of pulling out and putting on the table some of the pieces to talk about. So, you know, we talked about uh, fellowship a couple weeks ago, and we talked about making sure that Jesus is the reason for our fellowship. And, and uh, we're going to have to get more and more detailed on what fellowship is and stuff like that as we go with My whole goal today, if I were to summarize it, then you can blank out or whatever you want to do, is, is if we have a really bad definition of fellowship, then we're going to have a really bad definition of love and a really bad definition of um, walking in the light, which is to say living living and walking a good life as God's defining it. So it's like, how does fellowship relate to walking a good life? So I'm going to show you the verse that brings that out. And, uh, you know, and the goal, of course, is, you know, we, we, can, be, we can be completely one as a church family. And that's a supernatural thing, but we're going to have to focus on it. We're going to have to all desire that. And so this, this set of teachings that we're getting from 1 John, hopefully I'm not just making it up, right? Hopefully we can see it clearly from John. But the goal is to get us to this place where, where especially around fellowship, we understand what the word fellowship is really saying. It's, it's something that cannot be done on the human level because it requires the Spirit of God. So without the Spirit of God, we've never experienced what fellowship is. And so if we have a very low or very poor definition of fellowship, like, you know, and I'm not making fun of, um, you know, the Legion Hall or anybody, but, you know, they'll have a, a Legion Hall service, and then afterwards they'll say, you know, we'll meet for some fellowship after and, and have a lunch. Without the Holy Spirit of God, you can't use the word fellowship the way John's using it. <laughs> it's not sitting around eating coffee, chatting about the weather. It, it's, it's not that it's not that, but what, what's going on here is this inner unity where John has fellowship with the eternal life who was manifested to him in the form of Jesus. And he's offering fellowship to the church, the people, the people who believe. And they're all being brought into this partaking of the common life of the Spirit of God together through Jesus eating his body and drinking his life blood. I'm not going to get that after a Legion Hall service. <laughs> but it's something available to us. And if we have a low definition of it, we're, we're going to settle. And, and we're not going to be able to, to get there. So I'd like us to get there. If you, you guys, if I can sell you on, let's get there. Let's get there. Um, otherwise, we're gonna, we are going to... We're going to be a church instead of the church right? <laughs> the church is one in Jesus Christ. The church is one in Jesus Christ. And so we all become one with each other through our connection to the head. So if we said that is our goal, and then we learn from John that that's the goal, and then we learn from John how to get that goal, then we can get that goal. But to just kind of knock around and do some things and try to hope and have some coffee, we're not, we're not going to get there. We're not going to get there. So last week was partly to just kind of clear the table of some other thing before we put some things on it. So we were clearing the table of, man, our fellowship is based on Jesus. He's in the center of the table. 
if there's anything else in the center of the table, then we don't have what John is talking about with fellowship. We don't have spiritual unity. So, so that was last week, was to clear the table of things. And then, and then um, now we're going to start kind of building, as John's teaching here, on what fellowship is. So, you ready? This is really good stuff. I'm so happy to go here. Let's just read this. This is 1 John chapter 1, okay? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's first job. Where we want to go here is we want to look at this phrase. He's building um, the phrase around God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So, you know, oh, let me go back. If we look at verse 5, okay, I put it on the bullet point. This is a message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. This is a message we have heard from him. Who's the him that John is talking about? Jesus, the eternal life that was made manifest to their eyes, that they touched, that they looked, that they heard, that they touched with their hands. That person said, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So that's the basis for why John is saying that. But didn't John have a very particular experience on the mountaintop? Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother, John, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transformed in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became as white as the light. John saw Jesus, and light came out of him. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. This is also an Old Testament reality from Exodus 19. On the third day when the morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a loud trumpet sound, so that all the people of the camp <laughs> shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down in it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. So how did God manifest himself to the, to the Jews on the mountaintop? And when you look at fire, you're seeing a whole lot of light. So, so it's... it's um, it's a substantial reality. God is made out of light. We know that also from when Paul's talking to, I think it's Titus. God dwells in unapproachable light. So it's a, it's a substantial reality, but how do you get to know a being who is made out of light? How do you get to know their nature? And so what he said was, you get to know a being of light if they manifest themselves to you. That's what Jesus was. Okay, kind of Christianity 101. God is invisible. All you see is light. There's no knowing Him. What is, if we're talking about the sun. Let's say the sun is named um, Steve. Okay? And it's a person. How do you get to know Steve? He's a giant ball of light. There's not a lot to relate with. So God manifests His essential nature in someone that we can look at that also has eyes that has a mouth that we can hear. And that's what John is saying. We saw the eternal life. We saw the person of incredible light come and manifest himself to us as a person. And now we know him. So that 
reality of Jesus coming and manifesting the eternal life, okay, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which is with the Father and was made manifest to us. So we are talking about a being of light manifesting or showing up themselves into a, a, a human figure for our benefit, other benefits too we see in scripture, but one of them is so we can see and touch and hear and know, okay, it's one of them. But light also has another dynamic of being a metaphor. And he's going to use that metaphor. We already saw it. Light exposes darkness. Or that is to say, everything that's of God can be seen in contrast to everything that is not of God. That's all light and darkness is doing. Okay? You know how your fancy, expensive television works? And it looks at it when it's turned off, it's black. <laughs> you know, and then when they want to show you a picture, they only show the color, the light, that lets the picture see. Otherwise, it's black. Contrast opposite, seeing the difference. So God is light. He's 100% himself. And everything that's not him, it's called darkness. So his goal then, of course, is to, to share with us how do we interact with a being that is light and is light. You like that one? Okay. How do we interact with someone whose essential nature, if we're not like, we can't interact with, we can't have fellowship with. So he gets into it. He says, light exposes darkness. This is how to know what sin is. Okay, because God's nature is he knows, he sees, his light penetrates. No creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's light nature is it penetrates all, it sees all, it can see the contrast between himself and not himself and so he's going to cause us to have a time of account giving um, people who don't believe in Jesus get white thrown people who do believe in Jesus get BMC different conversation but he becomes the standard that's the big point right God himself is the standard of what needs to be exposed and what's not okay darkness is known because we hide from the light darkness, that is to say, dark acts, activities that are dark. We don't want them to be seen. Okay? If you're doing any kind of corruption, any kind of something where you're an owner of a company or a federal employee or something, and you're doing something corrupt, you hide it. Because if it's exposed, it's seen as darkness. And you come up with a good story. The way you go. Okay? This is how darkness works. We cover it. So if I cover my arm, that arm part is not getting light. So what Paul says to do in 5.8 of Ephesians, you were once darkness. Notice what he says, you were darkness. Not just you walked in darkness or kind of like darkness some. You were opposite of God. The complete contrast. But now you are children in the Lord. Walk as children of, of, of light. Wait, I thought I was a child of the Lord. Am I a child of light or a child of the Lord? Well, if the Lord is light... Nine, for the fruit of light results in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. See that there? The Lord sets the standard on what is darkness and light. Eleven, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made clear. For what makes everything clear is light. Pause. Everything that gets exposed to be different than God himself is seen to be different from God himself. And you can clearly see, oh, that's not light, that's dark. That activity, that attitude, that perspective, that belief, that whatever is now clearly seen to be darkness. Because, oh, I see it. Because I see what light is. I know what dark is. Okay, and then let's wrap it up. Get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. That's why it said, the Messiah will shine on you. And then finally, pay careful attention, then, to how you should walk. And it's that walk word that John uses. So check out our left corner. 1 John 1, 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk 
in darkness we lie and don't practice the truth. Bottom of the Ephesians 5 passage 15, pay careful attention then to how you walk. So, so what he's saying is our very lifestyle used to be darkness. Now we are reborn as children of light. We are indwelled with light. We have become one in a very real sense with light. Don't go back to the fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them and say, that is darkness. We gain a real power over evil when we call evil, evil. Right? <laughs> but if we don't name evil as evil, what, what then? What then? What, what if you have an enemy, and they really are an enemy, and you call them your friend? Do you let that enemy act like a friend with you? Because if they're an enemy, they're going to hurt you. <laughs> if you call an enemy an enemy, then you treat them like an enemy, you keep your distance, you stay away. If you call an enemy a friend, now he comes in. Okay? And, and not to use local examples, but take alcohol. People who don't label alcohol as their enemy, isn't this the AA way? Isn't this, ben? Isn't this the AA way? You name alcohol the enemy in the AA. You say, alcohol is my enemy, and I'm not touching it. And then people get power over it. <laughs> but if you're like, well, I've got a drinking problem, but I'm trying to get over it, but I still have a few beers now and then, is he your enemy or is he your friend? He's treating you like an enemy. <laughs> so is he your enemy or your friend? We take this everywhere. Anyway, and the more we label darkness, the more we call it evil, evil, the more we call darkness, darkness, the more it is verse, uh, chapter 5 of Ephesians. It's exposed. Now we say it's evil. Okay? You can watch TV. Then watch this. Something evil happens on the TV. Say, that's evil. What if you don't? Isn't that a curious thought? Isn't that a curious thought? So by labeling evil, evil, we're, we're calling darkness and light. We're separating and we're seeing. And now we can clearly see. Excuse me. Where we've often struggled in our Christian uh, culture is we have heard of the term legalism. And so then people say, man, if you play cards, you are engaging in an evil act. Okay, they wanted to label evil and, and good. They want to label light and darkness. There's nothing wrong with that, labeling that stuff. But calling card playing evil, I don't know, maybe they had a good reason. So we get into something called legalism where we start naming things that are evil that are neutral. <laughs> Shouldn't name neutral things evil. Otherwise, what do you name evil? Okay? But we still, we want to have, at the end of this, we're going to get to this point where all I'm going to say is, we want to have a zero tolerance for darkness. And that opens up maximum fellowship with light. Right? I'll say that again. If we have a zero tolerance for darkness, it opens up maximum fellowship with light. Because if I say that I have fellowship with light, but walk in the darkness... I am deluded, or that is to say I've been deceived to believe that fellowship is something I have defined, not what God has defined. Can I see that? So we want to get our definition of fellowship cleaned up. Okay. So, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Take the opposite. If we don't walk in the light, as he is in the light, we don't have fellowship with one another. Now, now remember, we're talking about how to become one here. If I am harboring darkness and calling darkness okay or light or something, that has a direct effect to my fellowship with one another, according to that verse. See that? So the more darkness I harbor, the further away I am going to be in fellowship from others. <laughs> Okay? It's called marriage. <laughs> right? So I want to walk in the light as he is in the light, and what do I get as a benefit? Yeah. Yeah, mutual partaking. And then this verse also gives us... Oh, yeah, Charlie. Question here. Okay, we always talk in shades of gray. Uh, everything is, well, you know, dark shade or a light shade of gray. We don't usually talk in black and white. Now, uh, when uh, uh, you, were, you were saying that that is God that de defines the whether it's light or dark, uh, how? 
Okay, say, take cards for instance, you say, well, that's not necessarily a, an evil thing. But uh, who, who defines that? Because, because we, we put the definition as to shades of gray on things. Um, how does God define, define card play? Okay, we we'll use that as a, a simple example. Yeah, great question, practical one. Does the Bible talk about cards? Well, but I, I'm sure or, or that's that, an example. That I mean, well, that's, that's the answer. Everything. That's yeah. the answer. Like, yeah. if it's not directly spoken of, then you do got to get into a discussion where you start saying, ultimately, what's helping my fellowship and what's harming my fellowship? Because that's where this, that's where this takes us. The effect of not calling dark things dark is a loss of fellowship. So if I make fellowship be my def definition, then I can see what's separating. So here's a classic one. And I joke about it, but I'll use it again. Okay, golf widows or hunting widows. Okay, is hunting wrong? Okay, is golf wrong? But what happens in these families is they lose fellowship because the man in this example is always out golfing or always out hunting. And so now there's a loss of fellowship. He's getting into darkness. His walk is moving into darkness. So the fellowship defined what was a neutral thing has now become a dark thing. Not because it itself was a dark thing. There are dark activities. But things that are neutral become dark because of their effect on our fellowship. So that would be one way that we're already seeing show up as a valuable way to discern those things. So, uh, so what you're saying then is that uh, it's not God that has uh, necessarily defined it, it's how we through the fellowship have learned to define it. Well, because God is love, mm -hmm. golf widow is destroying love. You got a hand there? Oh yeah, I got the, the card playing. Like that's not in the Bible, but greed is. Like God has said in a few passages not to have greed. So if you find in your card you're gambling or something and have a strong desire to gather money, that would be labeled as a greed component. So just to use your example, because that's where your mind was. Um, so that's in the Bible as being darkness, but the first activity is not. Yeah. Because that's it's got to be practical, especially a teaching like this. You got to have that practical, and that's why we're seeing here, walking in light. The benefit is fellowship with one another and with God Himself. So then that also that becomes my thermometer, or like hot and cold, hot or colder. What's more like fellowship, or what's a good activity? What's what will affect fellowship defines for me how I'm really doing in my heart. And if we were to be honest. Even though golf widow or hunting widow would lie and say, oh, we still got a great relationship, well, then you ask the other party. <laughs> okay. Mm. So you, then we ask God, how am I really doing with you? I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, I know for myself, I can't, it's not going to be fair for me to impose what I feel necessarily is dark, because there are neutral items to say to you, Matt. I could maybe bring to you a question, I don't know, I'm maybe seeing this, but I think the ultimate test is how honest can we be with ourselves and with the Holy Spirit? And the answer is always crystal clear in my heart, whether I'm justifying, whether I'm making excuses. If I, if I get to that place where it's absolute honesty with me and the Spirit, it's never been scared wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know that. Mm -hmm. He's very clear, and he will speak very clearly to my heart if I'm justifying, if I'm excusing, if I'm saying, well, so-and-so jumped off the bridge. Jumping off the bridge is okay. I mean, people bungee jumping is fine, but I have a few scars on my face, so maybe... Like, <laughs> it is not a good idea. My wife has some <laughs> apprehension, so... <laughs> But the other guy and his wife, they're, they're doing it together and they're having a marriage on the way down, right? So, but I know with me and my spirit when I'm compromising, when I'm justifying, when I'm excusing. Yeah. And so then I think that comes into that relationship and fellowship with me, with my maker and the Holy Spirit. Which brings it back to God is the definition of what is light. God is a definition of what is darkness. And going to him directly, absolutely. 
Like, at some point, we're going to have to have a relationship with God. So in that relationship, can I trust that he'll tell me if I'm off or on? <laughs> I would hope to say yes. Yeah, like, it's not a relationship otherwise. Got to have that communication on these questions. Good. Bring them up. If there are questions, I'll keep it going otherwise. Did that start to settle it a bit, Charlie, on the question, or...? Well, I don't, I don't know. When you live as long as I have, you, you do come up with a lot of uh, uh, problems with the gray areas and legalisms and everything else, you know. And yeah. uh, so it, 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 it doesn't. I mean, um, I'm not sure that it's necessarily cleared it up that much. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> There's a lot that Paul had to say in yeah. both of the Corinthians about all things are lawful to me, mm -hmm. but not all things are profitable. But I will not be mastered by any of them. So he deals with some of the gray area stuff by saying, what's mastering me? That's one area mm -hmm. that he uses for the Corinthians. And he'll say all things are lawful. So neutral things are available. But he doesn't want to be mastered. He has a higher goal in mind. Yeah. So that's other pastors. Well, that I, I think, him. you know, I think sometimes, like with what you're saying up there, then, uh, uh, you know, like, I, I think that a person comes along with a lot of baggage. And uh, in that baggage, you might, you might say, uh, say for instance, um, uh, some people will say, okay, I don't tr tr touch alcohol at all. Now, you might not touch it for a number of reasons, but uh, basically what you're saying is that God hasn't said that alcohol is bad unless um, it causes a problem somewhere. And I, I mean, I can understand that, you know, but... Uh, uh, do we do come with this baggage that puts it in a gray area and say, well, you know, uh, boy, I, I do like a, a drink now and again, <laughs> you yeah, know, and, uh, and I, I know this becomes a problem that uh, many people have to deal with. And do we not drink then because it becomes a, a um, kind of a challenge for other people that uh, may, uh, may face a similar problem or, you know, like... Uh, which, so how far do you take this? Well, this if point, we were know? to take that, like, take the idea of baggage, just to go with your thought because it's valid at the moment here. Like, if I come with my baggage, if I come with my gray area stuff, mm -hmm. does God have a definite answer for me on each one of those points? Does God have a definite answer? Yes. Am I aware of all those definite answers in this moment? No. If He showed me all of them at once, <laughs> would I collapse in a puddle right now? unable to move and deal with myself. Yeah. So then we do see a progression in him revealing. So I'm moving, but I'm answering, but I'm moving. You know, it's the idea that when he shows us an area that he's putting his finger on, and he's like, I want more fellowship, it's time now to work with this thing. Neutral, gray, whatever, baggage. We have these other terms that we use. He's like, this is where we're going to start working now. But you say, I've had a successful relationship with you this far, why does this have to go? Well, because we've hit a plateau in our fellowship. You are harboring darkness. I am light. I'm drawing you into light. You need to confess darkness. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he forgives and cleanses from all unrighteousness. This is the idea that if he shows me an area, maybe even if it's a new area that I've never dealt with before, got away with for years, and I didn't have a single conviction about it at all. And then he says, Actually, this area, I don't want you to have in your life anymore. It was fine last week. This is where we have to agree. The word confess is just a fancy word for agree, in the Greek especially. Just to agree with. So if God starts saying, this area is dark. It wasn't dark last week. Well, it was, but you didn't know about it. <laughs> it's time now. You know, I've heard the analogy, and I don't know if this analogy would fit 100%, but if you think about the promised land, they didn't conquer the promised land all at once. The Israelites marched in from one spot, and they took a couple dozen years to expand and fill across the whole promised land and conquer all of the evil inside of their promised land. We are promised full fellowship, promised full access to the light of God. But there is this funny little conquering... One little ite at a time. A Hittite, and then an Amorite, and then a Jebusite. Okay? So, even though we're talking about becoming one as a church, and that's good, it's not going to happen next week. It's not going to, let me say it again. It's not going to happen next week. 
Okay? But we create an environment where we're helping each other toward the same goal. We want to have fellowship with light. And in us, there will be no darkness at all. People shortcut that and they get to legalism. People shortcut that and they get to... I've been in some environments where like, well, you got to rebuke people for their sin. Yes, you do. Boy, is it tough to live here right now. <laughs> because I left my toothbrush out and you rebuked me for it. <laughs> so we don't go there either, right? There is this place where grace actually has the power to create an environment where light is, is magnetic and drawing rather than offensive and terminating of love and fellowship. If it's going to build fellowship, great. We're actually building toward this place. Remember how I said after this theme, we're going to get to the theme of correction? We're going to get to the place where we're going to have to learn to correct each other because it's all through the Bible and it's all through the Proverbs. You want to be wise? Take correction. <laughs> So we're going to have to get to this point where understanding light and darkness is going to mean, and it's in First John as well, looking at a brother and saying, I think you're in darkness. What if he disagrees? <laughs> what if you're wrong? Okay, that's territory that we don't like getting into, but we'll never get the goal of becoming one people in the light of Christ without some of these steps that the Bible talks about. I'm going to have to keep moving, even though I know I didn't finish your whole journey there, Charlie. But we're not done studying either. So. so this idea of being cleansed by sin, Zechariah had it. It's the removing of the filthy garments of sin. We see that God himself is the one who cleanses us. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And who's going to cleanse us? Jesus, okay? I'm not going to you for cleansing. You're not coming to me for cleansing. We're going to Jesus for cleansing. Okay, just like Zechariah had. But if we don't deal with our sin, it develops uh, crustiness. So Hebrews 3.13 says, Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Okay? Um, Candace, you're a baker. Describe what's happening here in this picture. James and Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Every time they come back from school, that's what I get in their lunch kit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so chemically, let's describe what's happening. The heat came to the dough and the outside edge responded first and then baked the inside and then James and Jesse decided it didn't taste as good as the inside. Okay. <laughs> and they're right. They're right. It is bad. It's gross. So this passage here is saying sin, remember sin, walking in darkness. If God starts putting my thumb, his thumb on an area of my life, I want to progress with you in light. And we start denying him that, not responding to the exhortations, we become hardened, crusty. And it becomes harder for him, and he's going to have to push his thumb harder and harder. And the breaking gets worse and worse. Proverbs says, a stiff-necked man will have his neck broken after many rebukes. God says, look over here, I want you to see light, an area of growth. No, you should. I won't. After many rebukes, oh, look, that thing can move around just fine. That's Proverbs. That's what's saying it. This is the warning. Be soft, be supple, be quick to identify sin. If there's an exhortation against sin, identify it, respond to it quickly. So we gain big benefits in the church family from that, right? Like, we gain... Fellowship. We get a big benefit in our relationship with God. We gain fellowship. So, kind of wrapping it up here a little bit. But, this is the idea. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The test of sin is fellowship. Okay, let's go back. When you and I stand in front of a being of perfect light, and in, the, in that eye of our mind, in that eye of our heart, when he starts communicating with us his nature and comparing it to our nature, 
and he starts showing. He's not being mean. He's showing the difference between he and I, he and you. Do you see why Paul says, I'm praying that you will be holy and blameless at the coming of the day of Christ? So this is, this is the goal, is he wants his whole nature to be communing with our spirit. According to 1 Corinthians 6, we become one spirit with the Lord. So a being of light is trying to get darkness out of us to get more and more communion. So we, were, we are looking at that end goal, and it is motivating us to desire that goal to happen. We feel that. We say, God, you are light, and I want fellowship with you. Show me my darkness. So if I get my fellowship definition to the point where I want to be one with Jesus, and I want to be one with others, that allows me to now say, okay, well, where am I out of fellowship? How could our fellowship grow? What's holding it back? What's the barrier to our becoming more one and closer? And that honestly becomes a really easy way to test. Because if the goal is closeness and unity, anything getting in the way of that has got to go. And that's that confession. This is darkness. It's in the way of fellowship. That makes sense, right? That's simple, that's basic. Okay. Yeah. So we just we want to get on this path where we uh, we develop a zero tolerance for darkness. Because if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. So this is different. How someone, you know, say it out loud or say it in your own head. How is this different than just becoming a group of people? who are all about being perfect and being more perfect than someone else and being the most perfect one in the group and all this other religious gobbledygook that starts happening in our heads and hearts. How is this different? I'll tell you how I think it's different. I think it's different because if we start becoming, as Paul says, you're comparing yourselves to yourselves, we get a very human thing where it's like, Who's on top and who's down? Pecking order. They're in the bottom in. But he's not describing that. He's describing unity, where everyone is equal and equally together and equally one to each other and equally one in Christ. And since that's the goal, we now help each other. We now want to, because of our desire for unity, we want to go there together. I want to go there myself. And we want to attain this thing called perfect fellowship in light. Perfect fellowship with the being of light. So getting darkness out of the way so that we can all have fellowship together is absolutely a goal worth being corrected for by the Holy Spirit and the exhortations of others. And that goal has to be enjoyed too. We want to get to a place where that's why we get together. To enjoy the light of Jesus together at the same time. They call that the temple. <laughs> That's what that was, right in the middle. Okay. So, we're going to sing that song that we learned, just because it's a new one, and I think it would be good to sing a song today. And kind of get us in the headspace there. <clears throat> Oh, 
topic where we're not, um, you know, we're not dealing with the feel-goods right now, but the feel-good definitely is the fellowship with light. To have that place where we really are one with you, we're close with you, we are, as was said, that we were able to converse with you honestly about what's hindering our hearts. And the benefit of that is fellowship. But Lord, you do have many, many, many places in Scripture where uh, you, you let us know that you're going to have to deal with the the, un, the idle words, is what Jesus said. Every idle word will be held to account. Um, or we, we are very loose people sometimes with our mouth and our actions and our way we treat each other. So Lord, we want to tighten it up. We don't want to be loose. We want to be people that are... are, are um, yeah, we don't wander. We're not wandering sheep anymore. We're not wandering away from each other. We're not wandering away from you. We're, we're, we're moving directly into the person of light. And you're guiding us, and we're confessing anything that doesn't line up with your wonderful nature. And we're happy to because of the benefit, Lord. So would you please uh, take this, this lesson and this teaching today and do something with us, Lord, that will allow us to get to that place where it's pure joy. Pure joy joy, pure joy. Lord, we've, we've tasted impure joy, but have we tasted pure joy? It's a wonderful and different goal entirely. So Lord, as was said too, we, we come with our baggage, we come with long journeys, and that's fine, Lord, and you have so much grace for that. But Lord, we don't want to get off of that journey and start to become resistant to your leadings and to your, 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 your thumb that says, no, this, this area here, this area here, Lord, we don't want to become hard. We want to be soft people, Lord. We don't want our necks broken after many rebukes. Lord, we want to be people that are easy for you to deal with, easy for you to work with, and we come together easily, and we come to you easily, too. So, Lord, that's our heart as we wrap it up this morning. Thank you for all your help in this. Thank you for the giving of Jesus to make it real and work. So we pray all in your name, God. Amen. Amen. All right, have a good week.